Hi, I'm Jens. So uh, this is based on a, on a paper with a large number of authors, as you can see. Uh, several of us are here today. So uh, for the questions, you might address uh, not just me, but the rest of the group as well. So let's see if I can get this to work. Ah, look. Right, so I'm here to introduce a new project that we uh, got funded. Well, we applied for funding and got it funded last year, well, this year, the beginning of this year. The project hasn't started yet, it starts in January. So there won't be any results whatsoever here, just really uh, a bit of background and an introduction. Um, so the funding comes from something called Riksbank and Jubileums Fund, which is one of the largest funders of uh, humanities research in Sweden. <coughs> and we got about 1 million euros uh, over a period of three years for this. It involves researchers from a, a wide variety of disciplines, for example, spoken language and, and conversation analysis, linguistics, phonetics, um, anthropology, um, human-machine interaction, but also, of course, speech technology. So it's a collaboration then between three Swedish Clarin members, and I'll talk a little bit about that group now. So we're an informal group of, of, of people um, who are, have an interest in, in speech rather than text, we could say. Uh, not, uh, that's not supposed to be exclusive, but it, we do try to focus on spoken language. Um, so the first group here is KTH, uh, and in particular the Department of, of Speech, Music and Hearing, which is where I work. Um, we're also a case center since the beginning of this year, I think. Uh, with a focus on speech technology then. Um, so at KTH we do research into um, spoken language as a research topic, uh, I think is what we do most of. So not really speech technology, but speech research. Uh, but we also do speech technology research and development, of course. So it's a double thing there. Um, that means that in a Clarin perspective, we are both users then and uh, technicians. Um, the second member is the Institute for Language and Folklore. This is a, a government agency and a very large one. Um, it includes researchers, we have some here, um, in, in, in several directions, so linguists, anthropologists. Um, it also has the um, something called the Swedish Language Council, which kind of give, gives advice of Swedish language use. Um, and it's an archive in itself, a, a very large archive containing speech, for example. Um, <clears throat> the digitized speech that exists at that archive is 13,000 hours, about, I think. And there is also an equal amount or more that hasn't been digitized yet, but we're not working on that. Uh, so the 13,000 hours of speech is, is our target here, or one of them, for this project. Um, the last partner is uh, a part of the Swedish National Archives called Digisam, which um, for which we have a representative there, Johanna. Um, so this is a group that, that works on digitalization of archives, um, also uh, has a lot to do with collaboration around things like that, and uh, information dispersal. And also the, the hosting agency there, the, the National Archives, is maybe the largest archive in Sweden. Um, so the, the reason why we wanted to do this, well, there are a couple. One of them is that, that big data has such a big influence on, on technologies today, and in particular on language technology. So um, it's difficult to, it's expensive, as everyone now, to record, and we're, we're trying to find ways of using data that is already out there. So not just data that was recorded at some point for research purposes, or at least not for speech research purposes, but stuff that was recorded for other purposes. We, we made a survey last year about this and found that there are tremendous amounts that are owned by the Swedish government one way or another, that sits in authorities, at universities, <coughs> or other government bodies. And we made an attempt to sort of see how much of this we could use. The, the uh, results were rather disconcerting. Although there is a lot of data and the ownership is not really the worst thing. Sometimes the ownership is kind of clear and we could use it for those purposes. Um, it becomes difficult because it's speech, that's one thing. So speech 
you can often hear who is talking, which makes it um, an integrity problem. It's not anonymized and it cannot be uh, anonymized. <clears throat> it's also impossible to know what's said if it's large speech data, right? So if you have something that was recorded in the 50s, people might well say things that aren't really legal to say today. And if you republish this, at least according to Swedish legislation, you're kind of responsible for those statements. Um, this makes people a little bit, um, well, not so happy with publishing openly, at least, these archives. So, so that's, that's, um, that was a little bit of a setback. On the other hand, um, this seems to be a, a, an area that is growing um, at Interspeech. Last year, there were three papers, I think, that I saw on, um, on, on what, what, what seems to be called found speech in our area now. So that's speech that wasn't recorded for technology develop, development. Uh, this year, it was about a dozen papers. So it's, it's growing, and people are really trying to, to use this kind of material. Um, so another another part of the background then is that well our our task one of our tasks in Claren is to try to combine <coughs> to combine speech technology or language technology with with uh, social sciences and humanities. This has proven kind of difficult. We, we've we've spent rather a lot of time trying to get collaborations running, and it, it's well as as many of you know, it's a little bit difficult to get started. So one of the things that we tried was to hold a um, a workshop last year where we invited um, social sciences and humanities researchers, but also data holders, so agencies that, that actually sit on data that could be used, um, and then speech technologists from, from KTH, then mainly. <coughs> and we put people together in little groups of three, so one researcher, one speech technologist, and, and one person with data, uh, and had them brainstorm uh, project ideas. What would you do if you wanted to help this researcher using that data? Um, so that was kind of successful. We got a lot of a uh, lot of pretty good project suggestions, and, and the project that I'm introducing now contains three of those, and it's the first uh, the first project where we actually got funding. But there are several others that we're working on. And the last part of this is is of course the actual funding. We were we got a little bit lucky, so. Riksbanken, uh, our, our funders, our sponsors, um, had a call called something like research in the collections. The, the entire purpose of that call was to try to make collections more accessible for research because they'd, um, they'd figured out that many of the collections that we have aren't really used much for any kind of research and they could be used better. Um, since we knew that there is a lot of speech in, in the collections, we, we thought that we would be kind of unique if we could say that we can probably use some of that speech. <coughs> so we tried it, sorry. So we tried it and, and it worked out, right? Um, so the, the basic idea of the project is to take these 13,000 hours of speech that, that is in our archive and to try to help researchers with it. So we have... Um, in order to, to see if that works, we set up three projects within the project. And um, I, I don't know, but many times when we've tried similar things, we kind of make up use cases that we think are good. And we, we've tried to go away from that now and use use cases that are actually real researchers than doing their, their everyday research, so to speak. I think that I think that might actually make us uh, make it easier for us to find real problems with the data and things like that. We've also sacrificed generality a little bit, which I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think that many in this room might see that as a problem, but I, I'm not sure, at least within speech, I'm not sure that there are good general solutions that we can use today. I think that we need to be able to find good specific solutions before we generalize, and we, we are at a lack of those as well. So what we're doing mainly here is to try to find good, workable, specific solutions to a couple of, of well-defined problems. And then we're hoping that from that, maybe we can find ways of generalizing. So the first research track is 
That has the least to do with direct speech technology, um, although it is involved. It's, it's um, studies of a collection created by one single person who's called Jösta Ilsring. It's a large, a large collection of, of letters and, and interviews. And what we're going to do with it is, well, we're going to try to help out getting into the speech data, right? So that, that's going to involve transcription of this, automatic transcription of the speech data, uh, but also maybe finding, um, segmenting it, just segmenting it, and things like that. Um, and we want to set it up so that you get uh, multimodal entries into the data through the speech and through the text. So that's kind of... That, that, that is kind of uh, normal archive work, only we try to get deeper into the speech data. Sorry. Um, the second project has to do with linguistic variation. So here, here we're going to have to use methods that aren't as standard. The, there's a lot of things you can do with language change over time, right? So in this case, we probably are going to look at uh, vowel pronunciation in the Stockholm area. So the way, that, the way that we look at that often is by painstakingly uh, labeling vowels manually and then looking at the variation. We, we know that it's possible to detect vowels automatically with, a, with ASR, with speech recognition. Uh, the results, if the, if the speech is perfect, are quite good. Now, if you take speech, take speech that wasn't recorded for these purposes and that you know nothing about, uh, the results are, are clearly going to be much worse. But we don't know how much worse, though. And we also don't know what tweaks we can use to, to improve things. So that's, that's what we're going to try to do here. We're going to see how much we can improve um, the efficiency of, of researchers into language variation um, and how much we can improve our methods to be more robust to strange materials. And the third and last project is, is uh, similar, but it has nothing to do with pronunciation. It's mainly, this is research that I've done rather a lot of before. Um, it has to do with the way we behave when we communicate face-to-face -face or over phone. So things like turn-taking, how you confirm that you've heard what someone says. Um, in, in order to get a handle on this, it's common that you just label the data, the speech, with simple labels like, is this person speaking or not? Um, this is silence, this is a pause. Um, and this again is something, we've done a lot of it, we have good models for it and we know how to get information out of the models. Um, but when you run it on data that you've never seen before, that you don't even know what the microphones were or what the situation was, uh, we don't really know what happens. So we're going to try doing that on 13,000 hours then, and, and see what we can get out of it. So I've got a minute, minute to go. You have more time, time for questions then. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for introducing the interesting project. Uh, please, questions. Yeah. Uh, once you have set up the service for the speech recognition, is that something you're going to offer to all the SSH uh, scholars? That, I mean, then you give them the responsibility uh, for the, the EPR, IPR and, and things like that, but that you offer the service. So here so not, is a web service, give us the file and we do the recognition. Yeah, so not, not in this project, it's not a part of this project, but we do have other projects that are, uh, aim exactly at setting up ASR servers uh, in the cloud. The, the best ASR we can get now is not made by us, it's made by, by companies, right? But as soon as you go into this kind of area where, where the data is unknown, then, uh, well, we're competitive, or rather the, the standard methods won't work as well. Yeah. So we have other projects where, where the intention is to do exactly that, and of course the outcome of this project goes into those projects. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, but please introduce yourself. <laughs> I forgot the yes. first, first uh, asking question. Daniel Korzunek from uh, Polish Claren. Uh, I just want to know, uh, I'm also working in speech technology, uh, but more as a te from technological point of view. And I want to know what the acceptable margin of error for doing research actually is on yeah. speech data. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I would say that that's one of the 
<laughs> That's one of the outcomes, again, of this project. We don't know this, right? We, we... So if you want to know something about, let's say, turn-taking, um, if, if you get a lot of noise in your speech, non-speech decisions, if it's white noise, if it's distributed evenly, I think you can cope with rather a lot, and you'll still get, you'll still get reasonable results. If the noise is biased... Uh, so that it will actually give you different answers to your, to your exact research questions, then, well, even a little noise is going to be really bad, right? So I think that's, th this is what, what I mean by there are real difficulties in setting up generic solutions to everything, because the, the errors, errors that you will get from, from speech technology things are, they might be okay for some purposes and not for others, and, and I don't think there is a blanket solution where you can say, we need 95% ASR, uh, and then it'll work. It depends on what you want to do with the results, right? So quantifying that kind of thing is, is a target here. Thank you. Yeah, please, Siska. Thank you for this uh, very interesting initiative. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned the, the number of hours that you now have available to, to work with, uh, 13,000. Uh, yeah. um, and I can imagine that all kinds of topics like uh, turn-taking can be studied in, in that co with that material. But um, I was wondering whether there are also uh, collections that, from the perspective of a humanities scholar, um, in itself has a, has a meaning and... Uh, uh, for which uh, speech technology could have added value on whether you do something special with collections oh. rather than just sets of data. Yeah, right. So the first, the first sub-project here works on one collection. So that's, not, that's just uh, 250 hours, I think, was that what I said? Oh. 250 hours of speech in that, and that's, that's one coherent collection that is treated uh, as a collection and researched as a collection right now. So that's an example that we, we have that sub-project in order to investigate exactly that. Right. Thank you. You did good in Hungarian Academy of Sciences. I was interested in the first project as well. Uh, if there's still some time left, I would really love to hear a bit more. Is it a project together with some anthropologists? Is it about yes. narratives or what's, what's the... Yeah, I, um, I'm not the right person to ask, but actually the right person to ask is one of the people who uh, is not here today. So I'll, <laughs> I'll try to answer the best I can. Um, yes, it's together with, uh, with an anthropologist, and what we're trying to do is to assist her in her everyday research very much. So she's already working on this material. Uh, she has a, if, if I remember correctly, she's got a double take on it, so she's interested in the material in itself. But she's also very interested in, in seeing how the way you treat collections actually affect the research, right? So there is a meta layer to it that, that is interesting to her as well. And what, what we're going to do is we're going to allow them to go into the speech parts of the data. That's, that's a collection of interviews, then, which are similar in nature to the letters that is the other part of it. So the, the interviews are about the same things as the letters. Um, and we're going to look at two things. One thing, of course, just simply how well can we do ASR, how well can we get into the speech data without it taking uh, thousands of man hours to, to do it. Uh, the, other th the other thing we're going to look at is how is this going to affect her research? So that access, how is that going to, going to affect the way she does re the research and the material is used? So that's, again, a, a meta kind of layer. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much once again for, 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 for the talk. <laughs>